Amen. Let's continue to worship together this morning. Christ is our way maker, our miracle worker, our promise keeper. He is our light in the darkness. Let's continue to worship this morning. sing together as this verse says you are here let's worship this morning you are here moving in our midst i worship you i worship you you are here working in this place i worship you i worship
it never stop working Even when I don't see it, you're working Even when I don't feel it, you're working You never stop, you never stop working You never stop working God is each and every day. He's worthy of all glory, all honor, and all praise as the miracle worker and promise keeper. Let's continue to worship together this morning. Is he worthy? Do you feel the world is broken? Do you feel the shadows deepen? But do you know that all the dark the glory of the Lord to be the light within our midst. Is it good that we remind ourselves of this? Lift your voice this morning. Is anyone worthy? Is anyone worthy? Is anyone holy?
thank you that you are the lion of Judah. You are the lamb who was sacrificed on the cross to pay a debt that we could not repay. And Lord, this morning as this song presents the question, is he worthy? Scattered all over this community, wherever we may be watching from this morning, we proclaim together, he is. You are worthy. You alone are worthy of all glory, all honor, all power. And Lord, we thank you this morning for the opportunity that you've given us to worship together in this place, wherever we may be. We thank you for the means of technology and making this possible. And Lord, we ask that you use this service as an instrument of your glory. Use every aspect of it, every song that's been sung, every word that's been spoken and will be spoken. Lord, use it to advance your gospel, to take your gospel forward. Use it to change lives and to save souls. God, in just a moment as Pastor Steve comes to deliver the message that you've placed upon his heart, I pray that we would be open and receptive as a congregation this morning to the moving of your spirit as you speak through him. Lord, use our pastor this morning mightily as an instrument of your glory to advance your gospel. Lord, we give you this service and ask your blessings over it. Lord, we love you. We praise you. We thank you for all your many blessings. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let me encourage you to take your Bibles and turn to Titus, the New Testament book of Titus, chapter 1. Today we're in a series of messages from Titus, and as you're making your way to the book of Titus, I want to take just a moment and thank uh, Daniel and our praise team for providing music this morning. Uh, the Christian faith is a singing faith. The Bible says we're to worship Him with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. We find numerous references in the Old Testament that we are to sing for joy. We sing not only because of the joy that we possess, but we sing in order to experience joy. We sing in order to take part of and participate in the joy that is ours in Christ. And so I thank so very much uh, the praise team for giving us the opportunity to worship through song today. If you found your way to Titus chapter 1, we'll be looking at verses 1 through 4. I'll be reading out of the NIV trans translation, Titus chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The Word of God says, Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to further the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness. In the hope of eternal life, which God, who does not lie, promised before the beginning of time, and which now at his appointed season he has brought to light through the preaching entrusted to me by the command of God our Savior. To Titus, my true son, in our common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Join with me in prayer. Almighty God, it is in the name of Jesus we bow in your presence, coming now to the preaching of your word. I pray that you would anoint me as your messenger, that my message not be with just wise and persuasive words, but a demonstration of the Spirit's power that men's faith rests not in the wisdom of men, but in the power of Almighty God. 
Lord, I claim your promise today that your word is alive and active and sharper than a two-edged sword. That your word is like the rain and the snow, which does not go forth without accomplishing your purpose. That your word, as the prophet Jeremiah declared, is like a hammer that shatters a rock to pieces. Your word is like a fire that burns in a man's soul. Today, I claim that promise that Jesus is the word of God. So it is my prayer this morning that you would open the eyes of our heart that we might see and respond to the Lord Jesus. I ask this in his holy, strong name. Amen. How can we live as God's people in an unholy and pagan world? Paul's short letter to Titus addresses that challenge. Sometime after his first Roman imprisonment, before his final imprisonment, Paul visited the island of Crete, and then left Titus there, as he describes in verse 5, to take care of some unfinished business. Last week, we looked at that particular part of the passage, the unfinished business, and how the Apostle Paul needed Titus to help him complete the work there in Crete. In addition to some very practical instruction about how to recruit and train leaders, the book of Titus has some incredible and significant theological and doctrinal issues. That's what we will consider this morning. There are many churches that focus on the packaging of their ministry, worship styles, music, age-specific ministries. But sometimes we can lose sight of the principles or the content of our faith. And while the form of a church ministry and its worship is vital, without a firm foundation, the church is building its ministry on sinking sand. Chuck Swindoll said, nothing is more significant than a solid foundation in Christ. Nothing is more motivational than an understanding of the doctrine of grace in order to live a productive life of service to God and others. That's what we're going to be considering today, some doctrinal issues, particularly about who God is and who Christ is. What do you think God is like? Now understand, I'm not asking what do you wish God was like. I'm asking what do you think God is like? How do you reconcile the God of Christmas with the God of the final judgment and a God of wrath? Can a good and loving God who is described as gracious, still allow those that reject His Son as the Savior of the world to go to hell? What is your understanding of how an all-powerful, all-knowing God allows bad things or evil to exist? How can a good God allow the coronavirus to devastate the world? These are just some of the questions associated with doctrine which is more than just an academic discussion. Possessing an understanding of the truths that define our faith guides us in our journey of faith, and it also inspires greater faith. J.I. Packer wrote one of the most popular doctrinal books on the subject of knowing God. He states in the introduction, As a clown yearns to play Hamlet, so I have longed to write a treatise about God. Like a clown attempting to perform a dramatic masterpiece, Packer concedes that his book is just a feeble attempt to describe the greatness, the glory, and the majesty of God. Why is it a feeble attempt? It's because the grace, the glory, the majesty of God is so grand and so big, so majestic, that it exceeds our human ability to describe Him accurately. But try where he must because it is the very foundation of our faith. While much of Christian teaching is dominated by practical steps, today I could have given you five steps to help you during this quarantine period, but I believe the most effective thing we could do is to turn our attention to Almighty God. There's a lyric from the great hymn, Be Thou My Vision, which says, Thou my best thought by day or by night. The best thing we could think about is to turn our attention to the things of God. Titus reminds us that one of the most practical tools for effective living is developing a deep appreciation or understanding of Christian doctrine. In other words, to live a productive life, we need a proper understanding and knowledge of who God is and what He did for us in the sending of His Son, the Lord Jesus. 
There are numerous subjects worthy of study, but the most important is the study of God himself. The proper study of every Christian must include the subject of what theologians refer to as the Godhead, God expressed as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Several years ago, the great preacher Charles Haddon Spurgeon described the importance of doctrine with these words. He said, the highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy which can ever engage the attention of a child of God is the name, the nature of the person, the word, the doings, and the existence of the great God whom he calls his Father. There is nothing exceedingly more improving the mind than the contemplation of divinity. It is a subject so vast that our thoughts are lost in its immensity, so deep that our pride is drowned in infinity. Other subjects we can grapple with, and in them we find contentment. But no subject of contemplation will tend to humble the mind and the thoughts of God. But while the subject humbles the mind, it also expands the mind. He who often thinks of God will have a larger mind than the man who simply plods around the narrow globe. Oh, there is in contemplating Christ a balm for every wound. In musing the Father, there's a quietus for every grief. In the influence of the Holy Ghost, there is a salve for every sore. Would you lose your sorrow? Would you drown your cares? Then plunge yourself into God's deepest sea. Be lost in His immensity, and you shall come forth from a couch refreshed and invigorated. I know nothing that can so comfort the soul and calm the billows of sorrow and speak peace to the winds of trial than a devout musing of the subject of the Godhead. Do you agree today that we need to expand our minds? Do you agree that we need calm for the sorrows and grief? Do you believe that we need peace In the midst of a storm, if so, then we need to turn our attention to the doctrines of God. Today we'll consider just two of them. There are numerous doctrines of the faith, but there are two specifically identified in this text that we'll look at this morning. That is the sovereignty of God's selection. And then secondly, the deity of the Savior. There are several verses that describe God's sovereignty, just to reference a few of them. Our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases, Psalm 115, verse 3. In Daniel chapter 4, it describes the story of Nebuchadnezzar who builds a golden statue requiring the people to bow down and worship him. Then Nebuchadnezzar has a bout of insanity. Then he repents and God restores his mind And Nebuchadnezzar makes this confession. He says, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted my eyes to heaven, and my reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High God. I praised Him and honored Him who lives forever. For His dominion is an everlasting dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and He does according to His will. In the New Testament, Acts chapter 4, it says, And when they heard it, they lifted their voices together and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them. Now these and other passages of Scripture boldly declare the sovereignty of God. We need to consider what is the sovereignty of God. What does the word mean? A sovereign leader is one who rules with the highest authority and has no equal. As Americans, we struggle with that because our form of government is one that is uh, governed by checks and balances. We have the executive branch, the legislative branch, and the judicial branch, and they, they check each other. But in a kingdom or a monarchy, there's a sovereign leader who rules with the highest authority and has no equal. That's who God is. The term sovereignty means that God has the capacity and the authority to do whatever he wants to do. He is not bound by checks and balances. He's not limited by any competing force. There are certainly those that oppose God, but his sovereignty is never diminished. Now, there's numerous aspects to the sovereignty of God, two of which I want to address this morning that are mentioned in the text. We see that God is sovereign over creation. We need to be reminded that we serve a God who created this world. Our text references to God making promises, and then don't miss the next clarifying phrase. It says, before the beginning of time, before time ever began, 
God existed. He existed before the beginning of time. It's because of his eternal existence and because of his great power that God is able to create the world. God is not the product of some big bang collision of molecules whereby non-living matter produced living things. God is separate from creation. He stands above creation because he existed before creation. Again, Jeremiah said, speaking, for God said, I, by my great power and my outstretched arm, have made the earth. Genesis begins with the bold testimony that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We see that creative power extended to Christ described in Colossians chapter 1, verse 16. All things were created by Christ and all things are held together by Christ. And that happens by his command. Author and pastor John Piper summed up beautifully the role of Christ in creation when he said, if Jesus stopped speaking, then we would stop being. We see in this brief little passage then that God is sovereign over creation. He exists before creation ever existed. A second area of God's sovereignty mentioned in the text is is the divine activity associated with the selection of the saints of God for salvation. When Paul uses the term, you see there in the text, the faith of God's elect, he calls attention to God's work or divine activity in the role of salvation. God is the one who brings a lost soul to the saving knowledge of Christ. Other terms are used to describe salvation. For example, we use the term Christian to describe one who is a follower of Jesus to illustrate that we are seeking to be like Christ. That's what the word Christian means. It means a little Christ. We want to live our lives in such a way that we are like Christ and be called Christians. We use the word believer to call attention to the fact that uh, Christianity is a faith-based relationship with God. It's not just a cultural or a legal attachment to a specific group. In addition to being Christians or believers, we use the term the saints of God. That was one of the Apostle Paul's favorite terms. He refers to Christians as the saints of God, calling attention to the fact that we were once dead in our trespasses and sin, once we were living in darkness and immorality, but God has saved us, he's redeemed us, and now our lives are to reflect the holiness and the righteousness of Christ. We're called the children of God. We're called brothers and sisters to illustrate the divine relationship that we now have with God as our heavenly father, as part of the heavenly family. Now, it's important to understand that the terminology is only designed to communicate one aspect of the faith. I reference that because there are entire schools of thought, even entire denominations that build themselves around just one aspect of faith this area of salvation called the doctrine of election. Some reject the biblical teaching of election because they believe that the individual has the sole control of their destiny. Others take election to an unbiblical length or an extreme, proposing that if God elects those who are saved, then logically then he elects those who would go to hell. Now the Bible doesn't teach that. There are numerous books, even volumes of books that have debated this subject for centuries. I don't think in just this short sermon we'll be able to solve all of the areas of debate concerning the issues described in Scripture, but it is possible that we can look at this text and appreciate that the biblical testimony is that God calls those that have been saved by grace through faith as the elect. Divine election calls attention to the work of God in the role of salvation. God is the one who saves lost souls. God is the one who sent His Son, the Lord Jesus, to die on the cross. Divine election is necessary because the Bible says that a lost man does not seek God, nor does a lost person understand the things of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14 says, the lost person doesn't understand them because they are spiritually appraised. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. 
Divine election reminds us then that we were once dead in our trespasses and sin, and God did for us what we could never accomplish for ourselves. God sent a Savior. The Lord Jesus, he died on a cross as the atoning sacrifice for our sin. The Holy Spirit draws us, for the Word of God says no one comes into the Lord except the Spirit draw him. The Holy Spirit brings conviction of sin and righteousness and judgment. Christ then seeks and saves. Christ forgives, he redeems, he restores our soul. He secures for us a home in heaven. No amount of human effort could accomplish what God did For us, that's what election describes. Election also describing God's activity illustrates for us human responsibility. When we understand what God did for us, it calls us to respond. Election does not negate the human responsibility to respond to the gospel. Notice in the text, Paul describes his ministry. He says, I'm a servant of God, verse 1. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. And in verse 3, he says that he is preaching this light in the appointed season, this ministry that was entrusted to him. Knowing that God's people were called the elect did not negate the responsibility of Paul to go preach. In another passage, he said, knowing the terror of God, I persuade men. Listen, if the divine election eliminated the need for human responsibility, then the Apostle Paul was wasting his life. If divine election automatically brought people into the kingdom of God, then Paul would have been better off remaining a tent maker. He would have been better off just teaching theology in a school for the Pharisees. But he did preach the gospel. In fact, he endured incredible hardship because of it. The Bible says that he was beaten on numerous occasions. He was imprisoned. He suffered greatly for the cause of Christ. He caused the saved, God's elect, and then he dedicated his life to bring lost people that they too would experience that same election. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 16, Paul said, For when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast. For I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. We see in these first few verses in the sovereignty of God over creation. He exists before time. We see his, excuse me, see his sovereignty over salvation as he calls the elect to respond to the preaching of the gospel. But notice another major area of doctrinal significance in these few verses, and that is the deity of the Savior. We see the equivalency of Christ with God the Father. In verse 3, we see the reference to the command of God our Savior, and then The closing part of his greeting found in verse 4, grace and peace from God the Father and Jesus Christ our Savior. This is called parallel equivalency where Paul's service to God and his service to Christ, that God is our Savior and Christ is our Savior. The two are used interchangeably. Six times in the book of Titus is the word Savior used. Three times it's used to describe what God did. Three times it's used to describe what the Son, the Lord Jesus, did for us. The interchange is significant. It reveals the mutual equality of roles that each plays in redemption. God the Father loves. God the Father sends His Son, but it's Christ who chooses to go to the cross as the atoning sacrifice, shedding His blood for our sins. And then God the Father raises Him from the dead. Jesus is co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent with God the Father. We need to also understand that this isn't just an academic debate, that it is necessity. It is a necessity that Christ be God in the flesh. For without Christ possessing these divine attributes, his death would not have been sufficient to atone for the sins of the world. Were Jesus Christ not holy and divine and the expression of God in the flesh, 
then his death would have only atoned for the sins of one person. He could have paid for the sins of one. But because he was holy, because he was majestic, because he was righteous, because he was pure, because he was powerful, it was a divine sacrifice sufficient to atone for the sins of the world. The equivalency of Christ is described as co-equal, co-eternal, co-existent with God the Father, and then we also see His majesty. He is God our Savior. In his book entitled The Trouble with Jesus, the former president of Moody Bible College, Joseph Stoll, describes an experience of attending the Chicago prayer breakfast and being surprised at what the breakfast had become. It was no longer a time to call upon God who sent His Son Savior and have that mercy and grace expressed in the city. It was now a collection of faiths, and the prayer breakfast was to be representative of all faiths. There was an Islamic priest who chanted a prayer to Allah, a woman rabbi, a Catholic priest, and a liberal Protestant who offered generic prayers for unity to the guiding force of all things. Stoll says not one time was the name of Jesus mentioned. It was clear, though nobody said the words outright, that all gods were welcome, but this Jesus who claims to be God and claims to be the Savior of the world was not welcome. The one who was the way, the truth, and the life was not going to be recognized, much less worshipped. One that Stoll calls a so-called Christian leader said that we need to move beyond the tradition of claiming that Jesus is the decisive issue of our faith because the claim is smacked with arrogance. I want you to listen to what Stoll says in his book. He says, in my mind, it was a gross underselling of who Jesus is to call him a tradition. But that's what he was being called. If I would stop speaking his name in public, or proclaiming his exclusive claims to deity, truth, or redemption, then we could celebrate the plurality of religions. Let's be honest, while not exclusive in the wideness of his mercy, Jesus is exclusive in his claim as the only solution for sin and the problem and the only way to God. The apostles understood this claim as they preached without reservation. There is no other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved except the name of Jesus. We must never choose to concede to a meaningless reduction of who Jesus is and what He came to accomplish. We must never try to downsize Jesus so He fits with other false gods. When you read the credentials that he has given in Colossians chapter 1, you understand why the disciples would preach there is no other name whereby we can be saved except the name of Jesus. Paul described it this way, Jesus Christ is the Son and the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers, rulers or authority, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and all things in him hold together. He's the head of the body of the church. He's the beginning of the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have the fullness of deity dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Every hope, every confidence that we have as believers is based upon who Jesus is. Without Christ, The story of the Bible falls apart for Jesus said, search the scriptures, they testify of me. Without Christ, my guilt and my sin remains forever for it is only the blood of Jesus that is sufficient to cleanse us from our sin. Without Christ, the way to God is closed for Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes unto the Father except 
by me. Without Christ, heaven is unprepared. For Jesus said, I go to heaven to prepare a room for you. And if I go there, I will come back and take you to be with me in my Father's house. Without Christ, our prayers go unanswered. For Jesus said, whatever you ask in my name shall be granted unto you. Without Christ, our joy is incomplete, for Jesus is good news of great joy. He prayed in John 17 that you would have the same joy that he enjoyed with the Father. Without Christ, we lose our greatest friend, for Jesus said, I do not call you slaves, but I call you my friend. Without Christ, there is no hope for eternal life, to experience the grace of God made possible through the atoning sacrifice of Christ on the cross is the greatest blessing one could ever experience in life, and to share that love is the greatest privilege we could ever experience. We should join with the choir, the angelic choir, and say, worthy is the Lamb that was slain, worthy to receive glory, honor, and power. Hymn writer Philip Bliss came as close as any other human writer to a, attempt to express praise to the Lord Jesus. He penned these words, Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Lifted up was he to die, it is finished, was his cry. Now in heaven exalted high, hallelujah, what a Savior. When he comes, our glorious King, all his ransomed home to bring, then a new song we'll sing, hallelujah, what a Savior. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Dear elect of God. Grace and peace to you from God the Father and Christ our Savior. If you're watching today, I want to exhort you, I want to challenge you, I want to beg that you would give your life to Christ. I would ask that you call upon His name, claiming the promise that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Would you bow your head and when would you say and just cry out to the Lord today, would you say, oh God, in the name of Jesus, I confess that I'm a sinner. I believe that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. I believe that His blood atoned for my sin. By grace, through faith, I repent of my sin and receive the gift of eternal life. Save me. Forgive me. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer today, we want to know about it. We ask that you would contact the church, call us, send us an email, send us a letter. Let us know that we might rejoice with you and get some resources to you to follow up that you might continue to grow in the faith. Again, church family, thank you so much for choosing to worship with us uh, via online today, and we uh, hope to be able to meet together soon, be watching for the various announcements on how we'll be able to do that. And in order to keep uh, these services as familiar as possible and to bring some comfort, hopefully through some routine, I'm going to ask Brother Mike Byers if he will come at this time and he will share with us his concluding prayer and God bless you. Thank you so much. May the grace of God continue to bless you. Brother Mike. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence in our lives. Thank you for being with us as we have worshipped you all in one accord this morning. We thank you that you are such a great God. Oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. We thank you that you're such a great God that nothing surprises you or catches you off guard, but you know everything that is, is taking place. And we know that you tell us to look up unto the hills from which comes our help, and we know our help comes from you. You tell us to trust you with all of our hearts and lean not on our own understanding. 
but to trust you and know you will direct our paths. And we place ourselves in your hands today and these days ahead and trust you and pray you will be in control. Father, we know you tell us to cast all our care and anxiety upon you because you care for us. And we thank you that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And we're thankful that Jesus lives. And because he lives, we too can live. Because he lives, we can face tomorrow. And because he lives, all fear is gone. Because we know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because Jesus lives. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And we pray in his name, the name above every name, the blessed name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.